A spot of decorating. Paddington gave a deep sigh and pulled his hat down over his ears in an effort to keep out the noise. There was such a hullabaloo going on, it was difficult to write up the notes in his scrapbook. The excitement had all started when Mr. and Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Bird received an unexpected invitation to a wedding. Luckily, both Jonathan and Judy were out for the day, or things might have been far worse. Paddington hadn't been included in the invitation, but he didn't really mind. He didn't like weddings very much, apart from the free cake, and he'd been promised a piece of that whether he went or not. All the same, he was beginning to wish everyone would hurry up and go. He had a special reason for wanting to be alone that day. He sighed again, wiped the pen carefully on the back of his paw, and then mopped up some ink blots which somehow or other had found their way onto the table. He was only just in time, for at that moment the door burst open and Mrs. Brown rushed in. Ah, there you are, Paddington. She stopped short in the middle of the room and stared at him. Why on earth are you wearing your hat indoors? she asked. And why is your tongue all blue? Paddington stuck out his tongue as far as he could. It is a funny colour, he admitted, squinting down at it with interest. Perhaps I'm sickening for something. You'll be sickening for something all right if you don't clear up this mess, grumbled Mrs. Bird as she entered. Just look at it. Bottles of ink, blue, bits of paper, my best sewing scissors, marmalade all over the table runner, and goodness knows what else. Paddington looked around. It was in a bit of a state. I've almost finished, he announced. I've just got to rule a few more lines and things. I've been writing my memories. Paddington took his scrapbook very seriously and spent many long hours carefully pasting in pictures and writing up his adventures. Since he'd been at the Browns, so much had happened, it was now more than half full. Well, make sure you do clear everything up, said Mrs. Brown, or we shan't bring you back any cake. Now do take care of yourself, and don't forget, when the baker comes, we want two loaves. With that, she waved goodbye and followed Mrs. Bird out of the room. You know, said Mrs. Bird, as she stepped into the car, I have a feeling that bear has something up his paw. He seemed most anxious for us to leave. Oh, I don't know, said Mrs. Brown. I don't see what he can do. We shan't be away all that long. Ah, replied Mrs. Bird darkly, that's as may be, but he's been hanging about on the landing upstairs half the morning. I'm sure he's up to something. Mr. Brown, who didn't like weddings much either, and was secretly wishing he could stay at home with Paddington, looked over his shoulder as he let in the clutch. Perhaps I ought to stay as well, he said. Then I could get on with decorating his new room. Now, Henry said Mrs. Brown firmly. You're coming to the wedding, and that's that. Paddington will be quite all right by himself. He's a very capable bear. And as for you wanting to get on with decorating his new room, you haven't done a thing towards it for over a fortnight, so I'm sure it can wait another day. Paddington's new room had become a sore point in the Brown household. It was over two weeks since Mr. Brown had first thought of doing it. So far, he had stripped all the old wallpaper from the walls, removed the picture rails, the wood around the doors, the door handle, and everything else that was loose, or that he had made loose, and bought a lot of bright new wallpaper, some whitewash, and some paint. There matters had rested. In the back of the car, Mrs. Bird pretended she hadn't heard a thing. An idea had suddenly come into her mind, and she was hoping it hadn't entered Paddington's as well. But Mrs. Bird knew the workings of Paddington's mind better than most, and she feared the worst. Had she but known, her fears were being realised at that very moment.
Paddington was busy scratching out the words at a loose end in his scrapbook and was adding in large capital letters the ominous ones decorating my new room. It was while he'd been writing at a loose end in his scrapbook earlier in the day that the idea had come to him. Paddington had noticed in the past that he often got his best ideas when he was at a loose end. For a long while, all his belongings had been packed away, ready for the big move to his new room, and he was beginning to get impatient. Every time he wanted anything special, he had to undo yards of string and brown paper. Having underlined the words in red, Paddington cleared everything up, locked his scrapbook carefully in his suitcase, and hurried upstairs. He had several times offered to lend a paw with the decorating, but for some reason or other Mr. Brown had put his foot down on the idea, and hadn't even allowed him in the room while work was in progress. Paddington couldn't quite understand why. He was sure he would be very good at it. The room in question was an old box room, which had been out of use for a number of years, and when he entered it, Paddington found it was even more interesting than he had expected. He closed the door carefully behind him and sniffed. There was an exciting smell of paint and whitewash in the air. Not only that, but there were some steps, a trestle table, several brushes, a number of rolls of wallpaper, and a big pail of whitewash. The room had a lovely echo as well, and he spent a long time sitting in the middle of the floor while he was stirring the paint just listening to his new voice. There were so many different and interesting things around that it was a job to know what to do first. Eventually, Paddington decided on the painting. Choosing one of Mr. Brown's best brushes, he dipped it into the pot of paint and then looked round the room for something to dab it on. It wasn't until he had been working on the window frame for several minutes that he began to wish he had started on something else. The brush made his arm ache, and when he tried dipping his paw in the paint pot instead and rubbing it on, more paint seemed to go onto the glass than the wooden part, so that the room became quite dark. Perhaps, said Paddington, waving the brush in the air and addressing the room in general, perhaps if I do the ceiling first with the whitewash, I can cover all the drips on the wall with the wallpaper. But when Paddington started work on the whitewashing, he found it was almost as hard as painting. Even by standing on tiptoe at the very top of the steps, he had a job to reach the ceiling. The bucket of whitewash was much too heavy for him to lift, so that he had to come down the steps every time in order to dip the brush in. And when he carried the brush up again, the whitewash ran down his paw and made his fur all matted. Looking around him, Paddington began to wish he was still at a loose end. Things were beginning to get in rather a mess again. He felt sure Mrs. Bird would have something to say when she saw it. It was then that he had a brainwave. Paddington was a resourceful bear and he didn't like being beaten by things. Recently, he had become interested in a house which was being built nearby. He had first seen it from the window of his bedroom, and since then he had spent many hours talking to the men and watching while they hoisted their tools and cement up to the top floor by means of a rope and pulley. Once, Mr. Briggs, the foreman, had even taken him up in the bucket, too, and had let him lay several bricks. Now the Brown's house was an old one, and in the middle of the ceiling there was a large hook where a big lamp had once hung. Not only that, but in one corner of the room there was a thin coil of rope as well. Paddington set to work quickly. First he tied one end of the rope to the handle of the bucket. Then he climbed up the steps and passed the other end through the hook in the ceiling. But even so, when he had climbed down again, it still took him a long time to pull the bucket anywhere near the top of the steps. It was full to the brim with whitewash and very heavy. 
so that he had to stop every few seconds and tie the other end of the rope to the steps for safety. It was when he undid the rope for the last time that things started to go wrong. As Paddington closed his eyes and leaned back for the final pull, he suddenly felt to his surprise as if he was floating on air. It was a most strange feeling. He reached out one foot and waved it around. There was definitely nothing there. He opened one eye and then nearly let go of the rope in astonishment as he saw the bucket of whitewash going past him on its way down. Suddenly, everything seemed to happen at once. Before he could even reach out a paw or shout for help, his head hit the ceiling and there was a clang as the bucket hit the floor. For a few seconds, Paddington clung there, kicking the air and not knowing what to do. Then there was a gurgling sound from below. Looking down, he saw to his horror that all the whitewash was running out of the bucket. He felt the rope begin to move again as the bucket got lighter, and then it shot past him again as he descended to land with a bump in the middle of a sea of whitewash. Even then his troubles weren't over. As he tried to regain his balance on the slippery floor, he let go of the rope, and with a rushing noise, the bucket shot downwards again and landed on top of his head, completely covering him. Paddington lay on his back in the whitewash for several minutes, trying to get his breath back and wondering what had hit him. When he did sit up and take the bucket off his head, he quickly put it back on again. There was whitewash all over the floor. The paint pots had been upset into little rivers of brown and green, and Mr. Brown's decorating cap was floating in one corner of the room. When Paddington saw it, he felt very glad he'd left his hat downstairs. One thing was certain. He was going to have a lot of explaining to do, and that was going to be even more difficult than usual, because he couldn't even explain to himself quite what had gone wrong. It was some while later, when he was sitting on the upturned bucket thinking about things, that the idea of doing the wallpapering came to him. Paddington had a hopeful nature, and he believed in looking on the bright side. If he did the wallpapering really well, the others might not even notice the mess he'd made. Paddington was fairly confident about the wallpapering. Unknown to Mr. Brown, he had often watched him in the past through a crack in the door, and it looked quite simple. All you had to do was to brush some sticky stuff on the back of the paper and then put it on the wall. The high parts weren't too difficult even for a bear, because you could fold the paper in two and put a broom in the middle where the fold was. Then you simply pushed the broom up and down the wall in case there were any nasty wrinkles. Paddington felt much more cheerful now he'd thought of the wallpapering. He found some paste already mixed in another bucket, which he put on top of the trestle while he unrolled the paper. It was a little difficult at first, because every time he tried to unroll the paper, he had to crawl along the trestle, pushing it with his paws, and the other end rolled up again and followed behind him. But eventually he managed to get one piece completely covered in paste. He climbed down off the trestle, carefully avoiding the worst of the whitewash, which by now was beginning to dry in large lumps, and lifted the sheet of wallpaper onto a broom. It was a long sheet of paper, much longer than it had seemed when he was putting the paste on, and somehow or other, as Paddington waved the broom about over his head, it began to wrap itself around him. After a struggle, he managed to push his way out and headed in the general direction of a piece of wall. He stood back and surveyed the result. The paper was torn in several places, and there seemed to be a lot of paste on the outside, but Paddington felt quite pleased with himself. He decided to try another piece, then another, running backwards and forwards between the trestle and the walls as fast as his legs could carry him, in an effort to get it all finished before the Browns returned. Some of the pieces didn't quite join, 
Others overlapped, and on most of them were some very odd-looking patches of paste and whitewash. None of the pieces were as straight as he would have liked, but when he put his head on one side and squinted, Paddington felt the overall effect was quite nice, and he felt very pleased with himself. It was as he was taking a final look round the room at his handiwork that he noticed something very strange. There was a window, and there was also a fireplace, but there was no longer any sign of a door. Paddington stopped squinting, and his eyes grew rounder and rounder. He distinctly remembered there had been a door, because he had come through it. He blinked at all four walls. It was difficult to see properly because the paint on the window glass had started to dry, and there was hardly any light coming through. But there most definitely wasn't a door. I can't understand it, said Mr. Brown, as he entered the dining room. I've looked everywhere, and there's no sign of Paddington. I told you I should have stayed at home with him. Mrs. Brown looked worried. Oh, dear, I hope nothing's happened to him. It's so unlike him to go out without leaving a note. He's not in his room, said Judy. Mr. Gruber hasn't seen him either, added Jonathan. I've just been down to the market, and he says he hasn't seen him since they had cocoa together this morning. Have you seen Paddington anywhere? asked Mrs. Brown, as Mrs. Bird entered, carrying a tray of supper things. I don't know about Paddington, said Mrs. Bird. I've been having enough trouble over the water pipes without missing bears. I think they've got an airlock or something. They've been banging away ever since we came in. Mr. Brown listened for a moment. It does sound like water pipes, he said, and yet it isn't regular enough somehow. He went outside into the hall. It's a sort of thumping noise. Crikey, shouted Jonathan. Listen! It's someone sending an S.O.S. Everyone exchanged glances, and then, in one voice, cried, Paddington! Mercy me, said Mrs. Bird, as they burst through the papered-up door. There must have been an earthquake or something. And either that's Paddington, or it's his ghost. She pointed towards a small, white figure as it rose from an upturned bucket to greet them. I couldn't find the door said Paddington, plaintively. I think I must have papered it over when I did the decorating. It was there when I came in. I remember seeing it. So I banged on the floor with a broom handle. Gosh, said Jonathan, admiringly. What a mess! You papered it over when you did the decorating, repeated Mr. Brown. He was a bit slow to grasp things sometimes. That's right, said Paddington. I did it as a surprise. He waved a paw round the room. I'm afraid it's in a bit of a mess, but it isn't dry yet. While the idea was slowly sinking into Mr. Brown's mind, Mrs. Bird came to Paddington's rescue. Now it's not a bit of good holding an inquest, she said. What's done? is done. And if you ask me, it's a good thing, too. Now perhaps we shall get some proper decorators in to do the job. With that, she took hold of Paddington's paw and led him out of the room. As for you, young bear, you're going straight into a hot bath before all that plaster and stuff sets hard. Mr. Brown looked after the retreating figures of Mrs. Bird and Paddington, and then at the long trail of white footprints and paw marks. Bears, he said bitterly. Paddington hung about in his room for a long time after his bath, and waited until the last possible minute before going downstairs to supper. He had a nasty feeling he was in disgrace. But surprisingly, the word decorating wasn't mentioned at all that evening. Even more surprisingly, while he was sitting up in bed drinking his cocoa, several people came to see him, and each of them gave him ten pence. It was all very mysterious, but Paddington didn't like to ask why, in case they changed their minds. It was Judy who solved the problem for him when she came in to say good night.
I expect Mummy and Mrs. Bird gave you ten pence because they don't want Daddy to do any more decorating, she explained. He always starts things and never finishes them. And I expect Daddy gave you one because he didn't want to finish it anyway. Now they're getting a proper decorator in, so everyone's happy. Paddington sipped his cocoa thoughtfully. Perhaps if I did another room, I'd get another thirty pence, he said. Oh, no, you don't, said Judy sternly. You've done quite enough for one day. If I were you, I shouldn't mention the word decorating for a long time to come. Perhaps you're right, said Paddington sleepily as he stretched out his paws. But I was at a loose end. Paddington Turns Detective The old box room was finished at last, and everyone, including Paddington, agreed that he was a very lucky bear to move into such a nice room. Not only was the paintwork a gleaming white, so that he could almost see his face in it, but the walls were gaily papered, and he even had new furniture of his own as well. In for a penny, in for a pound, Mr. Brown had said, and he had bought Paddington a brand new bed with special short legs, a spring mattress, and a cupboard for his odds and ends. There were several other pieces of furniture, and Mrs. Brown had been extravagant and bought a thick pile carpet for the floor. Paddington was very proud of his carpet, and he'd carefully spread some old newspapers over the parts where he walked, so that his paws wouldn't make it dirty. Mrs. Bird's contribution had been some bright new curtains for the windows, which Paddington liked very much. In fact, the first night he spent in his new room, he couldn't make up his mind whether to have them drawn together so that he could admire them, or left apart so that he could see the view. He got out of bed several times, and eventually decided to have one drawn and the other left back, so that he could have the best of both worlds. Then something strange caught his eye. Paddington made a point of keeping a torch by the side of his bed, in case there was an emergency during the night, and it was while he was flashing it on and off to admire the drawn curtain that he noticed it. Each time he flashed the torch, there was an answering flicker of light from somewhere outside. He sat up in bed, rubbing his eyes, and stared in the direction of the window. He decided to try a more complicated signal. Two short flashes, followed by several long ones. When he did so, he nearly fell out of bed with surprise, for each time he sent a signal it was repeated in exactly the same way through the glass. Paddington jumped out of bed and rushed to the window. He stayed there for a long while, peering out at the garden, but he couldn't see anything at all. Having made sure the window was tightly shut, he drew both curtains and hurried back to bed, pulling the clothes over his head a little farther than usual. It was all very mysterious, and Paddington didn't believe in taking any chances. It was Mr. Brown, at breakfast next morning, who gave him his first clue. Someone's stolen my prize marrow, he announced crossly. They must have got in during the night. For some weeks past, Mr. Brown had been carefully nursing a huge marrow, which he intended to enter for a vegetable show. He watered it morning and evening, and measured it every night before going to bed. Mrs. Brown exchanged a glance with Mrs. Bird. Never mind, Henry dear, she said. You've got several others almost as good. I do mind, grumbled Mr. Brown, and the others will never be as good, not in time for the show. Perhaps it was one of the other competitors, Dad, said Jonathan. Perhaps they didn't want you to win. It was a jolly good marrow. That's quite possible, said Mr. Brown, looking more pleased at the thought. I've a good mind to offer a small reward. Mrs. Bird hastily poured out some more tea. <laughs> 
both she and Mrs. Brown appeared anxious to change the subject. But Paddington pricked up his ears at the mention of a reward. As soon as he had finished his toast and marmalade, he asked to be excused and disappeared upstairs without even having a third cup of tea. It was while she was helping Mrs. Bird with the washing up that Mrs. Brown first noticed something odd going on in the garden. Look, she said, nearly dropping one of the breakfast plates in her astonishment. Behind the cabbage patch. Whatever is it? Mrs. Bird followed her gaze out of the window to where something brown and shapeless kept bobbing up and down. Her face cleared. It's Paddington, she said. I'd recognise his hat anywhere. Paddington? echoed Mrs. Brown. But what on earth is he doing, crawling about in the cabbage patch on his paws and knees? He looks as if he's lost something, said Mrs. Bird. That's Mr. Brown's magnifying glass he's got. Mrs. Brown sighed. Oh, well, we shall know what it is soon enough, I expect. Unaware of the interest he was causing, Paddington sat down behind a raspberry cane and undid a small notebook, which he opened at a page marked List of Clues. Recently, Paddington had been reading a mystery story which Mr. Gruber had lent him, and he had begun to fancy himself as a detective. The mysterious flashes of the night before and the loss of Mr. Brown's marrow convinced him his opportunity had come at last. So far, it had all been rather disappointing. He had found several footprints, but he'd traced them all back to the house. In the big gap left by Mr. Brown's prize marrow, there were two dead beetles and an empty seed packet, but that was all. All the same, Paddington wrote the details carefully in his notebook and drew a map of the garden, putting a large X to mark the spot where the marrow had once been. Then he went back upstairs to his room in order to think things out. When he got there, he made another addition to his map, a drawing of the new house which was being built beyond the edge of the garden. Paddington decided that was where the mysterious flashes must have come from the night before. He stared at it through his opera glasses for some time, but the only people he could see were the builders. Shortly afterwards, anyone watching the Browns' house would have seen the small figure of a bear emerge from the front door and make its way towards the market. Fortunately for Paddington's plans, no one saw him leave. Nor did anyone see him when he returned some while later, carrying a large parcel in his arms. There was an excited gleam in his eyes as he crept back up the stairs and entered his bedroom, carefully locking the door behind him. Paddington liked parcels, and this one was particularly interesting. It took him a long time to undo the knots on the string, because his paws were trembling with excitement. But when he did pull the paper apart, it revealed a long cardboard box, very brightly coloured, with the words, Master Detective's Disguise Outfit, on the front. Paddington had been having a battle with himself ever since he'd first seen it several days before in a shop window. Although seven pounds seemed an awful lot of money to pay for anything, especially when you only get one pound a week pocket money. Paddington felt very pleased with himself as he emptied the contents onto the floor. There was a long, black beard, some dark glasses, a police whistle, several bottles of chemicals marked Handle with Care, which Paddington hurriedly put back in the box, a fingerprint pad, a small bottle of invisible ink, and a book of instructions. It seemed a very good disguise outfit. Paddington tried writing his name on the lid of the box with the invisible ink, and he couldn't see it at all. Then he tested the fingerprint pad with his paw and blew several blasts on the police whistle under the bedclothes. He rather wished he'd thought of doing it the other way round, as a lot of the ink came off on the sheets, which was going to be difficult to explain. But he liked the beard best of all. It had two pieces of wire for fitting over the ears, 
and when he turned and suddenly caught sight of himself in the mirror, it quite made him jump. With his hat on, and an old raincoat of Jonathan's, which Mrs. Brown had put out for the jumble sale, he could hardly recognize himself. After studying the effect in the mirror from all possible angles, Paddington decided to try it out downstairs. It was difficult to walk properly. Jonathan's old coat was too long for him, and he kept treading on it. Apart from that, his ears didn't seem to fit the beard as well as he would have liked, so that he had to hang on to it with one paw while he went backwards down the stairs, holding on to the banisters with the other paw. He was so intent on what he was doing that he didn't hear Mrs. Bird coming up until she was right on top of him. Mrs. Bird looked most startled when she bumped into him. Oh, Paddington, she began. I was just coming to see you. I wonder if you would mind going down to the market for me and fetching half a pound of butter. I'm not Paddington, said a gruff voice from behind the beard. I'm Sherlock Holmes, the famous detective. Yes, dear, said Mrs. Bird, but don't forget the butter. We need it for lunch. With that, she turned and went back down the stairs towards the kitchen. The door shut behind her, and Paddington heard the murmur of voices. He pulled off the beard disappointedly. Thirty-five buns worth, he said bitterly to no one in particular. He almost felt like going back to the shop and asking for his money back. Thirty-five buns were thirty-five buns, and it had taken him a long time to save that much money. But when he got outside the front door, Paddington hesitated. It seemed such a pity to waste his disguise, and even if Mrs. Bird had seen through it, Mr. Briggs, the foreman at the building site, might not. Paddington decided to have one more try. He might even pick up some more clues. By the time he arrived at the new house, he was feeling much more pleased with himself. Out of the corner of his eye, he had noticed quite a number of people staring at him as he passed and when he had looked at them over the top of his glasses, several of them had hurriedly crossed to the other side of the road. He crept along outside the house until he heard voices. They seemed to be coming from an open window on the first floor, and he distinctly recognized Mr. Briggs's voice among them. There was a ladder propped against the wall, and Paddington clambered up the rungs until his head was level with the window sill. Then he carefully peered over the edge. Mr. Briggs and his men were busy round a small stove, making themselves a cup of tea. Paddington stared hard at Mr. Briggs, who was in the act of pouring some water into the teapot, and then, after adjusting his beard, he blew a long blast on his police whistle. There was a crash of breaking china as Mr. Briggs jumped up. He pointed a trembling hand in the direction of the window. Caw! he shouted. Look! An apparition! The others followed his gaze with open mouths. Paddington stayed just long enough to see four white faces staring at him, and then he slid down the ladder on all four paws and hid behind a pile of bricks. Almost immediately there was the sound of excited voices at the window. Can't see it now! said a voice. Must have vanished. Cool, repeated Mr. Briggs, mopping his brow with a spotted handkerchief. Whatever it was, I don't never want to see nothing like it again. Fair chew me to the marrow, it did. With that, he slammed the window shut, and the voices died away. From behind the pile of bricks, Paddington could hardly believe his ears. He had never even dreamed that Mr. Briggs and his men could be mixed up in the affair, and yet he had definitely heard Mr. Briggs say his marrow had been chilled. After removing his beard and dark glasses, Paddington sat down behind the bricks and made several notes in his book with the invisible ink. Then he made his way slowly and thoughtfully in the direction of the grocer's. It had been a very good day's detecting, and Paddington decided he would have to pay another visit to the building site when all was quiet.
It was midnight. All the household had long since gone to bed. You know, said Mrs. Brown, just as the clock was striking twelve, it's a funny thing, but I'm sure Paddington's up to something. There's nothing funny in that, replied Mr. Brown sleepily. He's always up to something. What is it this time? That's just the trouble, said Mrs. Brown. I don't really know. But he was wandering around wearing a false beard this morning. He nearly startled poor Mrs. Bird out of her wits. He's been writing things in his notebook all the evening, too. And do you know what? No, said Mr. Brown, stifling a yawn. What? When I looked over his shoulder, there was nothing there. Oh, well. Bears will be bears, said Mr. Brown. He paused for a moment as he reached up to turn out the light. That's strange, he said. I could have sworn I heard a police whistle just then. Nonsense, Henry, said Mrs. Brown. You must be dreaming. Mr. Brown shrugged his shoulders as he turned out the light. He was much too tired to argue. All the same, he knew he had heard a whistle. But as he closed his eyes and prepared himself for sleep, it never crossed his mind that the cause of it might be Paddington. Lots of things had been happening to Paddington since he'd crept out of the Browns' house under cover of darkness and made his way round to the building site. So many things had happened, one after the other, that he almost wished he'd never decided to be a detective in the first place. He felt very glad when, in answer to several loud blasts on his whistle, a large black car drew up at the side of the road and two men in uniform got out. Hello, hello, said the first of the men, looking hard at Paddington. What's going on here? Paddington pointed a paw dramatically in the direction of the new house. I've captured a burglar, he announced. Oh, what? asked the second policeman peering at Paddington. He had come across some very strange things in the course of duty, but he had never been called out in the middle of the night by a young bear before. This one seemed to be wearing a long black beard and a duffel coat. It was most unusual. A burglar, repeated Paddington. I think he's the one that took Mr. Brown's marrow. Mr. Brown's marrow? repeated the first policeman, looking rather dazed as he followed Paddington through his secret entrance into the house. That's right, said Paddington. Now he's got my marmalade sandwiches. I took a big parcel of them inside with me, in case I got hungry while I was waiting. Of course, said the second policeman, trying to humour Paddington. Marmalade sandwiches. He tapped his forehead as he looked at his colleague. And uh, where is the burglar now? Eating your sandwiches? I expect so, said Paddington. I shut him in the room and I put a piece of wood under the door so that he couldn't get out. I got my beard caught in one of the sandwiches, so I switched my torch on to take some of the hairs out of the marmalade, and then it happened. What happened? chorused the policeman. They were finding it rather difficult to keep up with Paddington's description of the course of events. I saw someone flashing a light outside the window explained Paddington as patiently as he could. Then I heard footsteps coming up the stairs, so I lay in wait. He pointed towards a door at the top of the stairs. He's in there. Before either of the policemen could ask any more questions, there came the sound of banging, and a voice cried, Let me out! Good heavens! exclaimed the first policeman. There is someone in there. He looked at Paddington with renewed respect. Did you get a description, sir? He was about eight feet tall, said Paddington recklessly, and he sounded very cross when he found he couldn't get out. Hmm, said the second policeman. Well, we'll soon see about that. Stand back. With that, he pulled the piece of wood from under the door and flung it open, shining his torch into the room. Everyone stood back and waited for the worst to happen. To their surprise, when the man came out, it was another policeman. Locked in, he exclaimed bitterly. I see some lights flashing from an empty house, so I go to investigate. And what happens? I'm locked in. By a bear, he pointed towards Paddington. 
And if I'm not mistaken, that's him. Paddington suddenly began to feel very small. All three policemen were looking at him, and in the excitement, his beard had fallen off one ear. Um, said the first policeman. And what were you doing in an empty house at gone midnight, young fellow my bear? And wearing a disguise at that? I can see we shall have to take you along to the station for questioning. It's a bit difficult to explain, said Paddington sadly. I'm afraid it's going to take rather a long time. You see, it's all to do with Mr. Brown's marrow, the one he was going to enter for the vegetable show. The policemen weren't the only ones who found it all rather hard to understand. Mr. Brown was still asking questions long after Paddington had been returned from the police station to the family's safe keeping. I still don't see how my losing a marrow has got anything to do with Paddington being arrested, he said for the hundredth time. But Paddington wasn't arrested, Henry, said Mrs. Brown. He was only detained for questioning. Anyway, he was only trying to get your marrow back for you. You ought to be very grateful. She sighed. She would have to tell her husband the truth sooner or later. She'd already told Paddington. I'm afraid it's all my fault, really, she said. You see, I cut your marrow by mistake. You did, exclaimed Mr. Brown. You cut my prize marrow? Well, I didn't realize it was your prize one, said Mrs. Brown. And you know how fond you are of stuffed marrow. We had it for dinner last night. Back in his own room, Paddington felt quite pleased with himself as he got into bed. He'd have a lot to tell his friend Mr. Gruber in the morning. Once the inspector at the police station had heard his full story, he had complimented Paddington on his bravery and ordered his immediate release. I wish there were more bears about like you, Mr. Brown, he had said, and he had given Paddington a real police whistle as a souvenir. Even the policeman who had been locked in said he quite understood how it had all come about. Besides, he had solved the mystery of the flashing lights at last. It hadn't been anyone in the garden at all, but simply the reflection of his own torch on the window. When he stood up on the end of the bed, he could even see himself quite plainly in the glass. In a way, Paddington was sorry about the marrow, especially as he wouldn't get the reward. But he was very glad the culprit hadn't been Mr. Briggs. He liked Mr. Briggs, and besides, he'd been promised another ride in his bucket. He didn't want to miss that. Trouble at Number 32 That evening, after the bonfire had died away, the weather suddenly became even colder. When Paddington went upstairs to bed, he opened his window a few inches and peeped out in case there were any more fireworks to see. He sniffed the cold night air and then hastily shut the window, diving into bed and pulling the blankets over his ears. In the morning, he woke much earlier than usual, shivering with cold, and found to his surprise that the ends of his whiskers, which had become uncovered during the night, were quite stiff. Having listened for a while to make sure breakfast was being cooked, he put on his duffel coat and went along to the bathroom. When he reached the bathroom, Paddington made several interesting discoveries. First, his flannel, which he'd left folded over the towel rail the night before, was as stiff as a board, and it made a funny crackling noise when he tried to bend it straight. Then, when he turned the tap, Nothing happened. Paddington decided quite quickly that he wasn't meant to wash that morning, and hurried back to his own room. But when he got there, he had yet another surprise. He drew the curtains and tried to look out of the window, only to find that it was all white and frosted, just like the one in the bathroom. Paddington breathed heavily on the glass and rubbed it with the back of his paw. When he had made a hole big enough to peer through, he nearly fell over backwards with astonishment. 
all traces of the previous evening's bonfire had completely vanished. Instead, everything was covered by a thick blanket of white. Not only that, but there were millions of large white flakes falling out of the sky. He rushed downstairs to tell the others. The Browns were all sitting round the breakfast table when he burst into the dining room. Paddington waved his paws wildly in the air and called for them to look out of the window. Good heavens, exclaimed Mr. Brown, looking up from his morning paper. What is the matter? Look, said Paddington, pointing towards the garden. Everything's gone white. Judy threw back her head and laughed. <laughs> it's all right, Paddington. It's only snow. It happens every year. Snow? said Paddington, looking puzzled. What's snow? It's a nuisance, said Mr. Brown crossly. Mr. Brown wasn't in a very good mood that morning. He hadn't expected the weather to change so quickly, and all the upstairs water pipes had frozen. To make matters worse, everyone had been blaming him because he'd forgotten to stoke the boiler before going to bed. Snow? said Judy. Well, it's... It's sort of frozen rain. It's very soft. Jolly good for snowballs, exclaimed Jonathan. We'll show you how to make them after breakfast. We can clear the paths at the same time. Paddington sat down at the breakfast table and began undoing his napkin, hardly able to take his eyes off the scene outside the window. Paddington, said Mrs. Brown suspiciously, did you wear your duffel coat when you washed this morning? A lick and a promise, said Mrs. Bird as she handed him a steaming bowl of porridge, and more promise than lick, if you ask me. But Paddington was much too busy thinking about the snow to hear what they were saying. He was wondering if he could speed up the breakfast by having all his things on one plate. But just as he reached out for the bacon and eggs and the marmalade, he caught Mrs. Bird's eye and hurriedly pretended he was only conducting to the music on the wireless. "'If you do go out after breakfast, Paddington,' said Mrs. Brown, "'I think it would be nice if you could clear Mr. Curry's path for him before you do ours. We all know it wasn't your fault about his suit last night, but it would show you mean well.' "'That's a good idea,' exclaimed Jonathan. "'We'll give you a hand. Then we can use all the snow we get to build a snowman this afternoon. How about it, Paddington?' Paddington looked rather doubtful. Whenever he tried to do anything for Mr. Curry, something always seemed to go wrong. At back no playing snowballs, warned Mrs. Bird. Mr. Curry always sleeps with his bedroom window open, even in the middle of winter. If you wake him, he won't like it at all. Paddington, Jonathan and Judy agreed to be as quiet as they could, and as soon as breakfast was over, they dressed in their warmest clothes and rushed outside to look at the snow. Paddington was very impressed. It was much deeper than he had expected, but not at all as cold as he thought it would be, except when he stood for very long in the one place. Within a few minutes, all three were busy with shovels and brooms, clearing Mr. Curry's paths for him. Jonathan and Judy started on the pavement outside the house. Paddington fetched his seaside bucket and spade and began work on Mr. Curry's back garden path, which was not quite so wide. He filled his bucket with snow and then tipped it through a hole in the brown's fence near the place they intended building a snowman later in the day. It was hard work, for the snow was deep and came right up to the edge of his duffel coat, and as fast as he cleared a space, more snow came down covering the part he'd just done. After working for what seemed like hours, Paddington decided to have a rest. But no sooner had he settled himself on the bucket than something hit him on the back of the head, nearly knocking his hat off into the bargain. Caught you! yelled Jonathan with delight. Come on, Paddington, make yourself some snowballs, then we can have a fight. Paddington jumped up from his bucket and dodged round the side of Mr. Curry's shed. Then, after first making sure Mrs. Bird was nowhere in sight, he gathered up some snow and rolled it into a hard ball. Holding it firmly in his right paw, 
he closed his eyes and took careful aim. Yah! shouted Jonathan as Paddington opened his eyes. Miss me by a mile! You'd better get some practice in! Paddington stood behind Mr. Curry's shed, scratching his head and examining his paw. He knew the snowball must have gone somewhere, but he hadn't the least idea where. After thinking about it for some time, he decided to have another go. If he crept very quietly round the side of the house, he might even be able to catch Jonathan unawares and get his own back. It was as he tiptoed past Mr. Curry's back door, clutching a snowball in his paw, that he noticed for the first time the door was open. The wind was blowing the snow through the kitchen, and there was already a small pile of it on the mat. Paddington hesitated for a moment, and then pulled the door shut. There was a click as it closed, and he carefully tested it with his paw to make certain it was properly fastened. He was sure Mr. Curry wouldn't want snow all over his kitchen floor, and he felt very pleased at being able to do another good deed, apart from sweeping the path. To Paddington's surprise, when he peered round the corner at the front of the house, Mr. Curry was already there. He was wearing a dressing gown over his pyjamas, and he looked cold and cross. He broke off his conversation with Jonathan and Judy, and stared in Paddington's direction. Ah, there you are, bear, he exclaimed. Have you been throwing snowballs? Snowballs? repeated Paddington, hurriedly putting his paw behind his back. Did you say snowballs, Mr. Curry? Yes, said Mr. Curry, snowballs. A large one came through my bedroom window a moment ago and landed right in the middle of my bed. Now it's all melted on my hot water bottle. If I thought you'd done it on purpose, Bear— Oh, no, Mr. Curry, said Paddington earnestly. I wouldn't do a thing like that on purpose. I don't think I could. It's difficult throwing snowballs by paw, especially big ones like that. Like what? asked Mr. Curry suspiciously. Like the one you said landed in your bed, said Paddington, sounding rather confused. He was beginning to wish Mr. Curry would hurry up and go. The snowball was making his paw very cold. Hum, said Mr. Curry. Well, I'm not standing out here in the snow discussing bears' pranks. I came downstairs intending to tell you off. He looked round approvingly at the clean pavement. But I must admit I've been pleasantly surprised. In fact, he turned to go back indoors. If you make as good a job of the rest, I might even give you ten pence. Between you, he added, in case they mistook his meaning. Ten pence, exclaimed Jonathan disgustedly. One measly tenpenny piece? Oh, well, said Judy, at least we've done our good deed for the day. It should last for a while, even with Mr. Curry. Paddington looked doubtful. I don't think it'll last very long, he said, listening hard. In fact, I think it's nearly over. Even as he spoke, there came a roar of rage from Mr. Curry, followed by several loud bangs. Whatever's up now? exclaimed Judy. That sounds like Mr. Curry banging on his back door. I thought I was doing him a good turn, said Paddington, looking very worried. So I shut it. I think he must be locked out. Oh, gosh, Paddington, groaned Judy. You are an unlucky bear today. Who shut my door? roared Mr. Curry as he strode round to the front again. Who locked me out of my house? Bear? he barked. Where are you, bear? Mr. Curry glared down the road, but there was not a soul in sight. If he had been a little less cross, he might have noticed three distinct sets of paw prints and footprints where Paddington, Jonathan, and Judy had beaten a hasty retreat. After a distance, the three tracks separated. Jonathan's and Judy's disappeared into the Browns' house. Paddington's went towards the market. He had seen quite enough of Mr. Curry for one day. Besides, it had gone half-past ten, and he had promised to meet Mr. Gruber for morning cocoa at eleven.
I really think Mr. Curry has gone a bit funny in the head, said Mrs. Brown later that day. He was standing outside the house in his pyjamas and dressing gown this morning, in all that snow. Then he started running round in circles, waving his fist. Mm, replied Mrs. Bird. I saw Paddington playing snowballs in his back garden just before that happened. Oh, dear, said Mrs. Brown. She looked out of the window. The sky had cleared at last, and the garden, with all the trees bowed down under the weight of snow, looked just like a Christmas card. It seems very still, she said, almost as if something was about to happen. Mrs. Bird followed her gaze. They've made a wonderful snowman. I've never seen such a good one before. It's only small, but it looks most lifelike. Isn't that Paddington's old hat they've put on top? asked Mrs. Brown. She looked round as the door opened, and Jonathan and Judy entered the room. We were just saying, she continued, what a lovely snowman you've made. It isn't a snowman, said Jonathan mysteriously. It's a snow bear. It's meant to be a surprise for Dad. He's coming down the road now. It looks as if he'll have more than one surprise coming his way, said Mrs. Bird. I can see Mr. Curry waiting for him by the fence. Oh, crikey, groaned Jonathan. That's torn it. Trust Mr. Curry to spoil things, said Judy. I hope he doesn't keep Dad talking too long. Why, dear? asked Mrs. Brown. Does it matter? Does it matter? cried Jonathan, rushing to the window. I'll say it does. Mrs. Brown didn't pursue the subject. She had no doubt she would hear all about it in due course, whatever it was. It took Mr. Brown a long time to get rid of Mr. Curry and put his car away in the garage. When he did come indoors, he looked very fed up. That Mr. Curry, he exclaimed, telling tales about Paddington again. If I'd been there this morning, he'd have got more than a snowball in his bed. He looked round the room. Uh, by the way, where is Paddington? Paddington usually liked helping Mr. Brown put his car away, and it was most unusual for him not to be there, ready to give poor signals. I haven't seen him for ages, said Mrs. Brown. She looked at Jonathan and Judy. Do you know where he is? Didn't he jump out at you, Dad? asked Jonathan. Jump out at me? exclaimed Mr. Brown, looking puzzled. Not that I know of. Why, was he supposed to? But you saw the snow bear, didn't you? asked Judy. Just by the garage? Snow bear? said Mr. Brown. Good heavens, you don't mean that wasn't Paddington? What's that young bear been up to now? asked Mrs. Bird. Do you mean to say he's been out there covered in snow all this time? I've never heard of such a thing. Well, it wasn't really his idea, said Jonathan. Not all of it. I expect he heard Mr. Curry's voice and got frightened, said Judy. Just you bring him indoors at once, said Mrs. Bird. Why, he might catch his death of cold. I've a good mind to send him to bed without any supper. It wasn't that Mrs. Bird was cross with Paddington. She was simply worried in case anything had happened to him. And when he came through the door, her manner changed at once. She took one of his paws in her hand and then felt his nose. Good gracious, she exclaimed. He's like an iceberg. Paddington shivered. I don't think I like being a snow bear very much, he said in a weak voice. I should think not indeed, exclaimed Mrs. Bird. She turned to the others. That bear's going to bed at once, with a hot water bottle and a bowl of broth. Then I'm sending for the doctor. With that, she made Paddington sit by the fire while she hurried upstairs to fetch a thermometer. Paddington lay back in Mr. Brown's armchair with his eyes closed. He certainly felt very strange. He couldn't remember ever having felt like it before. One moment he seemed to be as cold as the snow outside, the next he felt as if he was on fire. He wasn't quite sure how long he lay there, but he vaguely remembered Mrs. Bird sticking something long and cold under his tongue, which she told him not to bite. After that he didn't remember much more, except that everyone started running around, preparing soup and filling hot water bottles, and generally making sure his room was comfortable for him. Within a few minutes, 
everything was ready, and the Browns all trooped upstairs to make sure he was properly tucked in bed. Paddington thanked them all very much, and then, after waving a paw limply in their direction, lay back and closed his eyes. He must be feeling bad, whispered Mrs. Bird. He hasn't even touched his soup. Gosh, said Jonathan miserably, as he followed Judy down the stairs. It was mostly my idea. I shall never forgive myself if anything happens to him. It was my idea as well, said Judy, comfortingly. I expect we all thought of it together. Anyway, she added as the front doorbell rang, that must be the doctor, so we shall soon know. Dr. MacAndrew was a long time with Paddington, and when he came downstairs again, he looked very serious. How is he, doctor? asked Mrs. Brown, anxiously. He's not seriously ill, is he? Aye, he is, said Dr. MacAndrew. You may as well know, that young bear is very ill indeed. Playing in the snow when he's not used to it, no doubt. I've given him a wee drop of medicine to tide him over the night, and I'll be along first thing in the morning. But he is going to be all right, isn't he, Dr. MacAndrew? cried Judy. Dr. MacAndrew shook his head gravely. I wouldn't have cared to give an opinion, he said. I wouldn't have cared to give an opinion at all. With that, he bade them all good night and drove away. It was a very sad party of Browns that went upstairs that evening. While they were getting ready for bed, Mrs. Bird quietly moved her things into Paddington's room so that she could keep an eye on him during the night. But she wasn't the only one who couldn't think of sleep. Several times the door to Paddington's room gently opened, and either Mr. and Mrs. Brown or Jonathan and Judy crept in to see how he was getting on. Somehow it didn't seem possible that anything could happen to Paddington. But every time they looked at Mrs. Bird, she just shook her head and went on with her sewing so that they couldn't see her face. The next day, the news of Paddington's illness quickly spread around the neighborhood, and by lunchtime there was a steady stream of callers asking after him. Mr. Gruber was the first one on the scene. I wondered what had happened to young Mr. Brown when he didn't turn up for elevenses this morning, he said, looking very upset. I kept his cocoa hot for over an hour. Mr. Gruber went away again but returned shortly afterwards carrying a bunch of grapes and a large basket of fruit and flowers from the rest of the traders in the Portobello market. I'm afraid there isn't much about at this time of the year, he said apologetically, but we've done the best we can. He paused at the door. I'm sure he'll be all right, Mrs. Brown, he said. With so many people wanting him to get well, I'm sure he will. Mr. Gruber raised his hat to Mrs. Brown and then began walking slowly in the direction of the park. Somehow, he didn't want to go back to his shop that day. Even Mr. Curry knocked on the door that afternoon and brought with him an apple and a jar of calf's foot jelly, which he said was very good for invalids. Mrs. Bird took all the presents up to Paddington's room and placed them carefully beside his bed in case he should wake up and want something to eat. Dr. MacAndrew called a number of times during the next two days, but despite everything he did, there seemed to be no change at all. We'll just have to bide our time, was all he would say. It was three days later, at breakfast time, that the door to the Brown's dining room burst open and Mrs. Bird rushed in. Oh, do come quickly, she cried. It's Paddington! Everyone jumped up from the table and stared at Mrs. Bird. He's, he's not worse, is he? asked Mrs. Brown, voicing the thoughts of them all. Mercy me, no, said Mrs. Bird, fanning herself with the morning paper. That's what I'm trying to tell you. He's much better. He's sitting up in bed, asking for a marmalade sandwich. A marmalade sandwich, exclaimed Mrs. Brown. Oh, thank God. Goodness! She wasn't quite sure whether she wanted to laugh or cry. I never knew hearing the word marmalade could make me feel so happy. Just as she spoke, 
there was a loud ring from the bell which Mr. Brown had installed by the side of Paddington's bed in case of emergency. Oh, dear, exclaimed Mrs. Bird. I hope I haven't spoken too soon. She rushed out of the room, and everyone followed her up the stairs to Paddington's room. When they entered, Paddington was lying on his back, with his paws in the air, staring up at the ceiling. Paddington, called Mrs. Brown, hardly daring to breathe. Paddington, are you all right? Everyone listened anxiously for the reply. I think I've had a bit of a relapse, said Paddington, in a weak voice. I think I'd better have two marmalade sandwiches, just to make sure. There was a sigh of relief from the Browns and Mrs. Bird as they exchanged glances. Even if he wasn't quite himself yet, Paddington was definitely on the road to recovery. Thank <laughs> you.